line illustrated in this, they're even sharper. Um, and we're supposed to have that released in like a press release or something in early, early summer is what I heard. So when you guys see that in the paper about, you know, spotted owl trends and, and status, that's probably reflecting this thing and it should be coming out, I'd say within the next month. So, um, barred owls. Barred owls are, as I mentioned, one of the key threats to spotted owls. Um, they're closely related to spotted owls. They're of the same genus, um, Strix. They're um, about the same size, but a little bit larger, and they're much more aggressive. Um, they occupy similar habitats here now. I'm going to get into that a little bit more, but they're typically, their home ranges are about less than half of the size of the spotted owl home range. So you can fit um, a few more territories of barred owls into one territory of a spotted owl. So think about that in terms of resource use. At least historically, barred owls um, were native to the eastern forests of the United States. Um, they occurred in mixed forests with large trees near water, um, large unfragmented forests, mature forests that supported higher diversity of size classes, and large trees with um, cavities. Um, they lived in swamps or adjacent to swamps, pretty, pretty broad habitat types, but always with some large tree component. And in the second half of the century, there were occasional reports of barred owls um, west of the Great Plains, but not many. But by the 1990s and early 2000s, the sightings within the range of the spotted owl had really um, increased substantially. Um, no one was really sure what the threat level at that time was, but the two species appeared to occupy similar habitats, um, and the barred owls appeared to be more aggressive. Um, they often have been, I mean, they, they, they do display spotted owls from their territories. Um, but, and over this last decade of um, intensive monitoring, um, we've noticed that they've been quite, they've become widespread across the spotted owl range. They both like old forest habitats. Um, the barred owls are a little bit less picky about what they eat. Um, Wood rats and fly squirrels are important for both of the species, but um, barred owls will eat just about anything. Um, there was a presentation given by David Weems in one of the study areas in Oregon. I don't know if you guys saw that, but there was a visual, a picture that he had of a roost site in one of the barred owl territories that had occupied one of the previous spotted owl territories. And there was like a mitten, a pile of crawfish shells and bits and pieces, a pile of them, as if somebody had just sit there and shucked them. And so it's um, the pressure that's being put on just the forest ecosystem, not just spotted owls, but the, all of the things that inhabit these, these same forests are being, um, there's a lot of stressors being put on that by the pressures by the barred owls. So where the diet appears to be the same, um, where, I'm, I'm sorry, where there does appear to be the same niche as a niche separation, habitat selection and diet between the two appear to be increasing, um, steadily increasing in numbers while spotted owls uh, continue to be declining. This slide um, is a depiction of the proportion in the study area um, combined Washington, Oregon, and California. And this just illustrates the, um, the trends in barred owls occupying spotted owl territories over time. And this, again, this is only represents data from um, the late 80s through the mid-2000s. And so um, from what I'm understanding, the, the bars on that are going much higher than the rate of occupancy of barred owls and spotted owls. Um, the impacts. Um, in almost all of the long-term study areas, the patterns um, are similar to this. This one is represented um, by the Oregon Coast Ranges, but almost all of them show this similar pattern where the red line represents um, the barred owl locations, and the gray line represents the percentage of spotted owl territories that are occupied. So as we see barred owls moving in and occupying and become 
you know, occupying these areas, the barred out populations in those areas are declining. Um, and I could just note too, with that, um, there have been some um, efforts changed in survey techniques in, in the most recent years, like the last five years or so, where a lot of these study areas are actually still surveying. They're surveying for barn owls too, so they use a slightly different methodology. So some of those indications may be influenced by that, but for the most part, when you're surveying for spotted owls, for the most part, you can get a barn owl response. So there's, there's some adjustment that should be considered there. So the overall recovery strategy for spotted owls um, applies to all recovered plants for any listed species. Um, our goal is to improve the situation for the species so that they can be removed from the list, from the endangered species list. But despite the changes, um, or despite the, the changes in the threats that have been noted between 1990 and the current, um, our current recovery strategy focuses on three main factors. Um, that's that populations are sufficiently large and distributed so that the species no longer requires listing. We don't want to have fragmented populations. We don't want to have any isolated populations. We want um, kind of a continuum of birds represented across our range. Um, we want to make sure that adequate habitat is available to the species and will continue and not be threatened in the future. Um, and that the effects of the threats that are identified have been reduced or eliminated such that the populations are stable or increasing. So those, that's the framework that we base um, our, our recovery objectives on for the spotted owl. And how we get there is really complex. And I think that was, it's in part where um, Rich is going to be speaking to and Christine was. And um, I can speak maybe a little bit now about active management. Um, active management and ecological forestry um, this is one of the prefaces of the recovery strategy now is that we're identifying, you know, we work, everybody is recognizing that, that the habitat in the Pacific Northwest is off kilter a little bit, largely because of fire suppression, the history of fire suppression. And many of the forests, especially in the Klamath province, which is extremely fire prone, um, is not sustainable the way it is, and so um, both on federal lands and on non-federal lands, we are trying to emphasize um, ecological forestry so that um, things, the conditions of the forest that existed um, prior to fire suppression are, are attempted to be recreated. And I'll get at that a little bit. The second primary objective of the recovery plan is to protect occupied and unoccupied sites and important habitats. And then the third is barred owl management. Um, right now, um, the recently signed an EIS for an experimental barred owl control project, um, which has been um, initiated in um, on the Cooper demographic study area and um, will start up this fall in parts of Oregon. And the idea there is to get some uh, statistically valid data on what the, the owl, spotted owl's response is to removing barred owls that occur in their, in their home ranges. Um, so it's a repeated effort and um, some of this work has been ongoing on Green Diamond property. Um, I don't know if anybody was here when Will Diller from Green Diamond presented it um, at the college here. It was really, really interesting. Uh, and they're finding some um, positive effects of owls, spotted owls responding favorably to barred owls being removed. So to recap, in order to recover the spotted owl, we have to address both um, threats to the habitat and barred owls both. And it's really complicated. Um, neither one alone will be su sufficient to reverse the trend. Um, of, of declining trends, and the service has been clear about the need to address both of these. Um, conservation and management of spotted owl on federal lands is addressed under the Northwest Forest Plan. Um, we still rely on that quite heavily. Um, in addition to <coughs> numerous recovery actions described in the um, recovery plan, 
um, Recovery Action 10 speaks to um, protecting and retaining occupied and unoccupied owl sites along with high value habitat. Recovery Action 12 is one that addresses post fire salvage management. And Recovery Action 32 um, applies to kind of the best of the best, the most um, structurally diverse and old growth habitats um, on any kind of land allocation. These are identified as an area that kind of a refugia for effects of barn owls. So um, the, in, in 2012, the service um, revised the critical habitat rule for spotted owls, which um, also relies heavily on active forest management. Um, it identified areas that are key to um, survival and recovery across the range on federal and non-federal lands. I mean, California, we don't have any critical habitat designated on non-federal lands, but in um, Washington and Oregon, there are some state lands that are identified. Um, and so lastly, um, the barred owl is addressing, we're going to learn from this experiment and hopefully identify areas or um, mechanisms to, to, to deal with barred owls, at least in some parts of the range. It's going to be an impossible feat. There's no way we can address the barred owl all the way across the range everywhere. There's just no way. So it's where can we do that and what method is the most effective? Um, so the recovery plan addresses um, numerous um, things, and some of these apply to state and non-federal lands as well. Um, so I spoke to the removal experiment. Um, are there any questions? Yeah. Um, do you happen to know if there were changes um, by elevation above sea level that are different? You know, for each elevation in, in the decline of the spotted owls. So you're asking... Are they doing better at higher or better at lower elevation? <clears throat> um, so if everybody put that question, she was asking if we know anything about the owls declining trends or if they're doing better at higher elevations versus lower. And I don't have the answer to that. I don't think there's been... I mean, the study areas, you can get at that information in the study areas because they're... They do occur in different areas throughout the range, representing different habitat types. So maybe there might be some in the Cascades that are doing better than others, but across the board, um, all those variables that we measure, the production, the fecundity, which is the number of, of, of female young produced per female adult, and then population change, all of those are varying levels of decline. So I don't know if we can to what form does the forestry management take? What do you do to manage the forest? Um, okay, well, Rich is going to talk about non federal management, and Christine was going to talk about um, federal land. So the question, the question, sorry, um, the question was what are we doing about management? And um, Rich will speak to that on non-federal lands. But Christine, who was unable to attend tonight, um, was going to speak to not to federal lands. So on, on Forest Service lands here, it's just mainly what we have. Other parts of the range, it's BLM and Forest Service and Park Service. But in this part of the world, it's Forest Service. And the focus of their management now is restoration. They're focusing on restoration-based projects. And um, a lot of you guys, this is the backyard of the McLeod Management, Shasta McLeod Management Unit. And one of the projects that Christine was going to speak to was the elk restoration project. And so what they're trying to do is they're focusing in on um, the, the resiliency of that particular landscape. There's a lot of mortality that's been identified in that. And there's a lot of ingrowth that's happened which is similar to other lots of places in this landscape where you have a lot of large old growth trees that are distributed and fire has not been part of that system for about 100 years. So as a consequence, you have this growth of small diameter um, shade tolerant type of species like white fir and dud fir that historically weren't um, in that density. And so they're going to be treating some of that, doing some thinning they are applying the recovery, recovery objectives in that by identifying areas um, under Recovery Action 10, 
So they're, they're looking at where their important owl areas are, where their important habitat is, and they're taking a very thoughtful approach to that in, in designing the project. So they're designing it to protect it and not change the function of that habitat. So it's a pretty thoughtful project, and if you haven't um, been out on a field trip, if they, if they offer any more of those, I really recommend it. So that's the kind of project that kind of exemplifies what most of the national forests are doing here. They're also focusing on um, community-based resiliency projects, you know, where they're trying to do thinning around communities. Um, they did get a flush of money about five years ago, the forests up in this part of the world, to treat, to look at treating late successional reserves. So on the Klamath, anyway, I can speak to that. There's a number of um, active late successional reserve um, management projects ongoing that are doing the same thing, implementing a lot of prescribed fire, um, small density thinning, thinning around the big oaks, thinning around the big late successional dug firs. That's the objective of most. That's the focus right now of forest management on federal lands. Any more questions? Yeah, I don't know if I interpreted your slides correctly or not, but it seemed like since 1990, the species has continually yes. gone down. Yes. So the management and survivability of them has, it, it might have been not a survival species. You know, uh, here we, we cut down our, our stock, a lot of the industry in the forest to protect their habitat because they're going to die without the habitat. If they didn't have that, yet they're still dying. And so, what had been the failure of the Protection Act to keep them to flourish? Yeah, well, it's, it's a kind of... Oh. Um, did everybody hear that question? Okay, um, that's a really good question. And, and those of us are, who are involved in interacting with both federal and non-federal land managers have that in the back of our mind. It's like everything we try doesn't seem to be working. But I think the realization in the last decade in particular of the, of the um, effects of barred owls and the, the um, complications that they have brought on to this species because, as I mentioned, they occupy an area that's smaller, about half the size of the home range of a spotted owl. So if you have two, if you have two spotted owls whose home ranges was this big and you can pack in six, barred owls and they're all competing for the same resources, both you know nest sites and food. Um, you do the math and plus the um, the breeding of the barred owls, they have, they reproduce at a rate of like six times what the spotted owls do. Spotted owls nest every other year on average and they they produce one to two young each time. Barred owls nest about every year and they commonly have three young every year. So when you add up those those factors, um, I think what we're finding is the rate of, de of decline from spotted owls has been an effect of this compounding effect from um, barred owls. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, could there be a link also between the spread of invasive species such as crawfish, where there's a uh, uh, kind of a, like a feedback response of, of that's uh, another reason why there's a more propagation of the Owl. Well, the crawfish of the, of the barred owl yes. and increase in the barred owl. Invasive species from prey, I'm not so sure, but one of the theories that um, the cause that results in the cause of the spread of the barred owls is an anthropomorphic effect, and that is in the Great Plains historically, right? There were fires that you know maintained that prairie habitat and prevented trees from growing there. But since the you know expansion of westward expansion and um, colonialization of those habitats, we planted trees, windrows, farms, ranches. We have trees, and so some of that theory is that there was this, it created a kind of a stepping stone, and then they went up and in in through southern Canada and back down into British Columbia and southward. But I'm not sure about the prey. I've never heard. Is there that? Is there? Uh, Crawfish and a lot of well, we have native crawfish here. Oh, oh, oh. Um, I don't know if the crawfish that are in Oregon is a non-native species or not. Or 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, they rely heavily on flying squirrels and wood rats. Uh, but I don't know what the percentage of crawfish are of, of barred owls. It probably depends on where they are. But they are associated with, um, more associated with water than spotted owls. So maybe that's just a factor of that. Yeah. Uh, does the spotted owl have a natural predator? I don't know if you mentioned that or not. I, I didn't pick that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, the, the, they can be preyed, preyed, preyed on by great horned owls and goshawks, but that's often the young. You know, so great horned owls inhabit a slightly different habitat type than spotted owls, but now with the influence of barred owls, they're being pushed into these other habitats that are of lower quality and maybe preying or being subjected to um, the interactions with, with great horned owls. Goshawks also um, live in kind of older forest structures, and so they've worked it out, you know, through through their lives of cohabitation. But they can take out a spotted owl, clearly. You know, they're they're an apex predator, really. So they don't have um, unless there's fishers that climb in the tree and get their eggs or get their young. Um, you know, there's who knows? But commonly, they're an apex predator, so they're kind of at the top of the. Okay, in the interest of time, um, why don't we hold further questions until afterwards. Um, first I want to ask for, you can bring out more seats if anyone is uncomfortable. Um, anyone need to sit in a chair? Okay. Alright, the next I want to invite, um, so now we've sort of learned about what does, um, what's the current situation like, um, and we're going to learn about why? Um, why focus on this uh, particular species? So I'm going to call up Phil Dietrich, who has not given me his bio, so I'm just going <laughs> to... Oh, here it is. <laughs> I was just going to make something up. But <laughs> so Phil Dietrich worked as a field biologist in the Shasta Trinity National Forest from 1977 to 1984 and for other agencies until 1989. In 1990, he became a lead biologist for the forest policy for the Fish, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service in Sacramento and in Northern California. From 2001 till his retirement in 2010, he was the field supervisor for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Office in Wairika. And he's currently a consultant for forest wildlife management and Endangered Species Act compliance, and also serves as the executive director of the River Exchange located in Dunsmuir. So, your... Maybe better to hold on. Oh, there you go. That might help. Yeah, I can walk the room and pace. Because, um, and I might have to pace. Uh, in, in Northern California forest, if, if uh, in small numbers, if we went out to the woods at night, we would have the chance of finding six to eight different species of owls. So how did the northern spotted owl become the owl? The damn owl. The, the, all the things it's been called over the years uh, in, in its range. So I guess I'll stay with um, Most of my talk tonight is going to be in the form of words because a lot of the history that came down bringing us where we are today was is in the form of legalese and arguments and so on. But I did want to show you a nice picture of, of what an adult and juvenile spot owl look like in a peaceful repose. Uh, unfortunately, in, in discussing the history of how we got here, it is a review of a pretty unpleasant time, uh, of a time that was very unpleasant for small communities, for the timber industry, for managers of land management agencies, for biologists. Uh, the, the 1980s and the early 1990s were a, a time of they were pretty challenging to a lot of us in these communities within the range of Al. And so when I, when I think of those times, uh, it is not with particular fondness. And 
At the same time, I'm here to report uh, kind of as a, as a historian uh, of, of what happened to bring us to the, the place we are today with the management of the Northern Spot Owl that, that GM reported on. Uh, here's the range of the Northern Spot Owl. You've seen that already. Studies of the Northern Spot Owl began in particular with a young guy named Eric Forsman who was a student at uh, Oregon State and it was a fire lookout. <coughs> and he got interested in the owls that were calling in the late 60s and he became the first expert, wrote his master's thesis on the species. Early in the 1970s, people began asking him, well, how much do they need? And he thought at that time that they needed 250 to 300 acres of old growth per pair. In California, a fellow named Gordon Gould with California Department of Fish and Game began, or, began to organize the database of sightings in the early 70s, and he recognized that the habitat requirements needed a lot more work, but he was the first to begin to compile locations. And then the U.S. Forest Service, including the Shasta Trinity and Klamath National Forests, began doing surveys for species in the late 1970s. Into the 80s, the Forest Service in Washington, Oregon, and Northern California, and the BLM in Oregon, California, were surveying timber sales and instituting Northern Spot Owl Protection uh, Networks. And there was conflicting direction to field units, resulting from the conflicting regional and national goals for cutting timber, and then the policies that were beginning to come into protection for Northern Spot Owls. At local levels, issues arose between timber volume targets, which in those days were very high, and, and Northern Spotted Owl protection zones. The studies on the biology continued, and by the late 1980s, the Forest Service policy in California was requiring 1,000 acres of suitable habitat for each pair of the, in their protection network. So the amount of acres in, under protection began to come up, and that began to and that began, can you hear me okay through this? Is this all right? Uh, that began to conflict even more with uh, timber management. In those years, um, about 1% of the suitable habitat on federal lands in California was being harvested each year, and about 1.5% in Oregon and Washington. That means on a decadal basis, about 10% of the habitat in California was being lost per year, and about 15%, or excuse me, on a decadal basis, was being lost 10% per decade. And in, Cal in Oregon and Washington, about 15% per decade. The, while a lot of the uh, difficulties with Northern Spotted Owl are believed to be associated with the Endangered Species Act, Really, the National Forest Management Act was the first interaction between the species and regulatory policies because it requires the national forests under the regulations. It says fish and wildlife habitat shall be managed to maintain viable populations of existing native and desired non-native vertebrate species. So that was affecting national forest management years before the species was listed under the Endangered Species Act. Now this is an example of the kind of policy that was coming to field units from regional offices. And this is from the fellow who is the regional forester for the U.S. Forest Service in California. I never met Mr. Smith, but policy like this is a disaster. This says, I would fully expect trade-offs that do not result in irretrievable loss of species viability, nor future production of timber to be made at the district and forest level through the coordinated efforts of the disciplines involved. Essentially, they're kicking the can downhill to the ranger districts to solve the problem between the, uh, the, in, the unsolvable problem between high timber targets and high protection for northern spot owls. The policy at higher levels in those days was a disaster. Was it a so, in the, go on, 
<laughs> you look great, it's okay. Phil. In the, in the late 1970s and early 1980s, uh, this skinny, long-haired young biologist was working around here for the Shasta Trinity. And I was in the woods for days at a time, working at night on owls, and also working on eagles and peregrines. Essentially, on the, you know, I was the, what I called then the endangered species field jock for the Shasta Trinity. And there were other biologists on ranger districts that I worked with. And we tried to locate every spot on our site, and, and we banded uh, a few birds in those days, and we especially surveyed timber uh, artist plans. Or, or timber sale plans. When I went back into the district offices and the field supervisor and the, and the supervisor's office in Reading, I almost always had bad news. And it was, I guess it was kind of symptomatic of those times that the uh, biologists all over the U.S. Forest Service were in positions of conflict with managers. And um, you know, I, I was shouted at. I was ostracized. That, it was a, that, that's one of those times that, that was very unfortunate. With the benefit of hindsight from a historical context, I can see now that those managers were under uh, pressures which could not, they could not resolve, which I had mentioned to you before. Information was accumulating on a species that they were not particularly interested in. They had been trained in a school of forest management that was essentially uh, liquidating old growth in favor of converting the, the national forest lands into a, a plantation-style forestry. So there was a, a very uncomfortable transition going on between philosophies of forest and resource management. And it, the old paradigm did not die easy. I, I understand now that those, in, when I meet with those guys now, I run into them somewhere, we can uh, laugh about it and, and recognize that it, those were, they went our fault, but it was a, a very uncomfortable time. Under the ESA, there was a series of regulatory actions, status reviews, petitions, findings, findings overturned by the district court, and finally in 1990, the owl was listed as threatened under the ESA in, across the entire range in Washington, Oregon, and Northern California. And then the first round of critical habitat was listed soon after that. At about the same time, the Forest Service was realizing that they had a real problem. And they assigned their chief scientist, Jack Ward Thomas, to put together a group of scientists and try to figure out where to go from here. They said that their new strategy largely abandoned the current and, believe, and we believe flawed system in favor of protecting much, much larger blocks of habitat from harvest. And they stated that existing U.S. Forest Service management was a prescription for extinction. as a flat out statement from the scientific community uh, that, that came just before the listing decision. This is a page from the original listing decision document. And probably this page exemplifies the problem in, in one page. The top curve shows the decline in owl habitat on lands su suitable for timber production. I mentioned that the decline per decade was about 15%. And you can see that decline beginning in the 1950s with the beginning of what was called then the Douglas fir boom, as uh, veterans returned home from World War II and the economy boomed across the United States, there was a big push to harvest federal timber to supply that boom. And that went on through a, essentially a philosophy of forestry that was going to convert the federal lands from their original condition into a, a big plantation. For, that went on for about uh, for 30 years before the paradigm changed under the National Forest Management Act and the ESA. So this is a page from the original 1990 listing document, which is, I don't know, it's 100 pages long. It was a very unusual Federal Register notice that I have in my library still. 
the, co the public comments that came on the listing sort of exemplified the whole issue. There were over 23,000 public comments on the listing, of which 80% opposed listing. Over 85% of those were form letters. They did not contain, they did not contain scientific information. And then of the 15% that favored listing, almost two-thirds of those were form letters. It had, it had it, um, spun out of the realm of science into the realm of economics and, and personal philosophy about forest management. But the ESA requires that the decisions being made on that the decisions are made on the basis of science. At the time, the um, high officials in the Bush administration, this is the first Bush administration at the time this was all going down, there were a lot of attempts to um, make it come out different. And um, I'll tell you about some other of those, but this is one quote from a court case in Seattle. The most recent violation of the National Forest Management Act exemplifies a deliberate and systematic refusal by the Forest Service and the Fish and Wildlife Service to comply with the laws protecting wildlife. This is not the doing of the scientists, foresters, rangers, and others at the working levels of the agencies. It reflects decisions made by higher authorities in the executive branch of the government. Essentially, the, the chiefs of, in the Department of Ag and the Department of Interior recognized what a tremendous change this listing was going to make in the economy and in forest management. And they were trying to stop it in any way they could. And in doing so, they well, I, I won't say any way they could, but a number of different ways. And in doing so, they continually ran up against the, the courts because the laws have been made by Congress, the courts interpret them. And they, <clears throat> so the agencies lost court case after court case after court case in the late 80s and 90s as they tried to avoid the listing. So one of the things we're here to talk about a little bit is the, the Northern Spot Owl private lands. Everything I've been talking about to this point, it was primarily on federal lands. In 1982, the Fish and Wildlife Service thought that the species had been virtually extirpated on private lands. But by 1990, due to the work that was done by the timber nut industry, primarily here in California, especially in the Redwood Zone, Fish and Wildlife Service recognized that there were several hundred sites on managed private timber lands under particular situations. So while we knew of over 500 on federal lands in California, we recognized that at that point that there were several hundred on private lands. And by 1993, when I and the two other lead managers for the Department of Fish and Game and the Forest Service published a paper summarizing the status at that point, we uh, knew of about 890 sites on federal lands and over 700 sites on federal lands, or on non-federal lands. Something else was going on here that had not been recognized in the early days of uh, spotted owl management and, to some degree, in the listing. One of the most important pieces in the whole regulatory scheme lay in the California Forest Practice Rules in this obscure section that says that the Department of Forestry cannot approve a timber harvest plan the result in take of species listed under the federal ESA, and thus that's been authorized by a federal agents. So I was, um, I negotiated on behalf of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service with the California Board of Forestry and the CDF and the California Department of Fish and Game to put measures into the, the state forest practice rules that would enable them to come to a determination that would satisfy that first section. So that put in to a, a sort of a second level of review on timber harvest plants in California that was not present in Oregon and Washington. And it led to a whole regulatory scheme in California that is, that is unique with respect to spotted owls. Still in place today, there, there's been various uh, iterations of it, who was in charge and so on. But in California, there's been much more protection of northern spotted owls on private lands 
than there have been on private lands in Oregon and Washington. So a little bit more on spotted owls on private lands. The Endangered Species Act has a, a mechanism by which private landowners can get permits to take owls under certain circumstances if, and take essentially means to kill or harm, if those are done under circumstances where the population can persist. So because we knew that the owl had persisted in the face of timber management uh, before the listing, we were able to use some of those same measures, put them in the regulations under the so-called Habitat Conservation Plan, the HCP. And we negotiated the first one of those with Simpson Timber Company over in the second growth redwood country of Humboldt County in 1992, very early in the history of the management of the owl. In 1993, we tried to negotiate a plan that would cover the whole state and enable the permitting process for a timber harvest plant, but that failed. Interestingly, it failed because they could not figure out a funding mechanism. An almost identical funding mechanism was put in place under state law last year. We were just 20 years ahead of our time. And then in 1999, the, the Pacific Lumber ACP allowed displacement with, by setting an ownership population level, they said we will manage for X numbers of pairs and we'll keep X numbers of pairs. That was a level that was higher than the recovery plan that specified for that area. So uh, under our regulations, we issued them a permit to conduct forestry while they maintain an owl population. That's the sort of thing that in the long term, presuming it's successful, you have to have the science to back it up. But that's the hope, is that we can manage for natural resources and at the same time protect endangered species. In these cases, the science is, is still working there. It's greatly complicated by the recent incursion of the spotted owl. But in general, those plants that were working until the, the barred owl arrived. I'm sorry, the barred owl. No. But really what was happening was more than just one species. There was a change in the paradigm from management of one species to the recognition that these are ecosystems that support a lot of different species. And so the, when President Clinton convened the um, forest conference at the beginning of his term, set in place a massive planning exercise called the the Forest Ecosystem Management Advisory Team. That team met in Portland for almost all of the summer of 1993. It came up with a, another large plan that was not just about owls, but incorporated the emphasis that was arising on salmon. There's over 260 stocks of salmon at some risk on federal lands in the Northwest. And the selected alternative covered about 250 species or species groups of mammals, birds, fish, invertebrates, plants, fungi, and lichens, recognizing that, that this is a, a forest ecosystem. Now that has not um, totally come to pass, as I'll talk about in a second, but it was a big step, and it was a, a, a completely different approach from the approach that had been taken also by the executive branch in the Bush administration, who took on the problem by trying to squash it, here, the Clinton administration took on the process by trying to plan and incorporate. Um, I'll leave you to decide whether how uh, successful that has been. I'm going to sum up here with some general impacts of the implementation of the Northwest Forest Plan on forestry in California, in my opinion. First, on communities and on non-federal lands. The loss of mills and the loss of timber in infrastructure economic impacts to rural communities. Those have been heavy. There have been little to no impact on the economy at larger scales, say large regions or states. Because, for instance, in Oregon, the other industries, the tech industry and so on, were growing faster than the timber industry was declining. There has been a reduction of harvest on private lands in California, but that harvest now exceeds the harvest on federal lands there are increased costs of timber harvest plans on private lands due to the survey requirements. And there's been an aggregation of private ownerships as small landowners have been forced out of business by the regulatory costs 
and the, those lands have been bought up by big companies like um, Zero Pacific, uh, Green Diamond, and so on. Then the general impacts of Northwest Forest Plan implementation on forestry in California on federal lands. We've seen a large reduction in clear cutting and harvest volume from federal lands. Litigation and reductions in agency funding have resulted in overstocked lands on, uh, on overstocked stands on federal lands. And there's been a big shift in emphasis to thinning and fuels on federal land with inadequate budgets to do that. A lot of what I've talked about up to this point has been the response of the executive branch, the Forest Service and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service in particular, to this, these issues over the last 30 years. Uh, I guess I've been working on this stuff longer than that. Um, but I, I, in my opinion, a lot of this lies with Congress. Um, had Congress agreed to fund some of the measures that were proposed under the Northwest Forest Plan, I think that that could have proceeded um, in the way it was designed rather than coming to a standstill. In, Congress backed out on the deal, in my opinion, and in my opinion, they are still backing out on the deal. If, if Congress were able, in this day and age, to um, take on complex problems, to set ideology aside, to try to deal with real problems, we could have perhaps adequate budgets to do the sorts of force management that we need to do here, in my opinion to reduce fuel danger and to continue to manage for northern spotted owls and other species. With that, I will, this is a, a photograph from probably 1980 or so, looks about the same. Um, I'll take questions, sorry my voice is going, about time to quit. <laughs> questions? Yes? So, do you think there's a balance then between harvesting and protecting the species and fire management? Do I think there could be? Yes. Yes, I do. What do you think it would look like? Um, well, it would, it would, um, I gotta get to vision this a little bit. <laughs> on north facing slopes, on cool slopes, there'd be heavy dense stands where species like this can persist. The fire, the fire danger there is not as high. Around human communities, uh, stands would be thinned to provide uh, defensive space and reduce the spread of fire. On south-facing slopes and higher on ridgetops, there'd be extensive fuel breaks, and uh, those strategies would be varied with elevation and topography and known weather patterns. In the stream bottoms, there would be um, fairly dense canopies to protect streams, um, but not necessarily hands-off. Just my opinion, as a retired guy. <laughs> what's, the, what's the population estimate of spotted owls in the state? Now, I don't know. I'm retired, man. Oh. <laughs> Rich has got my back. Any, yes? Um, I guess I'm wondering, you know, today, in today's world, with um, the political um, acrimony that's going on, is there a better relationship um, of these agencies that need to be more system integrated as far as management of lands and species? Thank you for asking that. Her question was, is the relationship between the agencies who are assigned to do this management better now than it was in the old days? The question is absolutely much better. I think there's a lot better understanding between the agencies about the, the different priorities or about, well, about their, about their responsibilities. And also the removal of those conflicting priorities, those, the hardest targets of the 1970s and 80s, that has a lot to do with it, because that was just irresolvable. Jan might want to comment on that. She does it every day. Thank you. Yeah, that was a good question. I'd just like to add to that, because um, with the Northwest Forest Plan came this process called Streamlined Consultation, and it was a memorandum of understanding that was signed by all the federal agencies throughout the range of the Spotted Owl. 
that describe the process for developing these projects and getting the regulatory agencies like NOAA Fisheries and Fish and Wildlife Service involved early in the planning process so that we could identify um, means in which to minimize the effects and um, talk about areas that are of lower concern to spotted owls um, early in the process so that we're engaged at the beginning as the project is being developed. And um, to be blunt about it, it still varies among different units, but overall I totally agree with Phil that we it, the, the relationship is really good overall and we do get involved early and they do pull us in into their ID teams, their interdisciplinary teams when they're developing projects and ask for our input and advice. So that was a really good question. It's a big part of, of how we operate now, at least on federal lands. In the interest of time, we're going to move on to the next speaker, but all the speakers will be up afterwards so you can ask your questions. So I apologize about that. Um, so the, for the next part of the um, workshop, we're going to be talking about, so what's being done on the ground now? Sorry, can everyone hear me? Yeah. Okay. So we're going to be talking, talking about what's being done on the ground now, and so we'll have Rich Clue come up with Roseburg, um, and again, we were going to have Christine Jordan with the Forest Service, but she can make it due to an emergency. So Rich Clue grew up in Maryland, and he earned his Bachelor's of Science in Wildlife Management from Frostburg University. He then moved to California in 1990 and began working on spotted owls in Humboldt County. Um, he then earned his Master's of Wildlife Management from Humboldt State. He's been working with spotted owls for nearly 25 years as a biologist with various timber companies and is currently with Roseburg in Wheat. Okay, can everybody hear me all right? Thanks, Karen. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Um, as Kara said, I'm a wildlife biologist with uh, one of the local timber companies here out of Weed, Roseburg, and, and we manage, own and manage about 175,000 acres of commercial timberland in Shasta and Siskiyou counties, a little bit in Trinity, but not much. And we also have an Oregon membership, which is about 400,000 acres up there. So, Kara asked me to talk about the impacts of spotted owls on private land, on forest management on private lands. And so this is just a little bit of a review or kind of setting the stage for what private lands mean to forestry in California. Just some, some trivia here. California is second only to Alaska in terms of the amount of forested acres within a state. There's about 33 million acres of forest land in California. There's, I think, 38 million people. So almost an acre of forest land per person in the state. About 40% of that forest is privately owned. The other 60% obviously is publicly owned. There are 4.5 million acres of industrial timberland in California, and a little more than half of that is within the range of the spotted owl. Um, by industrial timberlands, what I mean are sort of what Phil was talking about, this consolidation. It's the larger um, owners, they, they basically that's their job, is to manage timber, produce timber on a sustainable basis, and lots of it. it it's not meaning the, the rancher that, that may have, you know, a 40-acre parcel or even a 4,000-acre parcel. It's, it's much larger than that. Um, there are another 5.3 million acres of small non-industrial forests within the range of the NSO. I know this about it now. Um, I've, I've typed in a bunch of abbreviations and acronyms in here. I'll try to say those out as I get to them. If I forget, just ask me what I'm talking about. Here is the, the breakout of the land ownerships within the state. Um, just a graphical representation of what I went through. 17.5% of the federal land, and federal and state land, is, is what we call reserve forests. That's wilderness areas, late successional reserves, riparian areas, state parks, national parks, national monuments basically where forest management is not allowed or is very difficult to, to have happen. Uh, the rest of the public forests are or could be managed in some way and, and most of the private forests are, are or could be managed also. Um, this is the basic ownership breakdown within the range of the northern spotted owl and the black dashed line around the eastern and southern edge there is, is the, the the political boundary, I, I guess, would be an accurate description of where the northern spotted owl lives. 
when you get down south, just above the Interstate 5 marker there, it's a continuous gradient of owls. Um, we just happen to call them north of the Pitt River, northern spotted owls, south of the Pitt River, California spotted owls. So the listing applied to the lands to the north and west of that black dashed line. California sustainably produces 1.3 billion board feet of timber per year from private forest lands. 850 million feet of that comes from within the range of the Northern Spotted Owl. So there's a lot of forest in California. A disproportionate amount of the wood from those private forests come from within the range of the Northern Spotted Owl. So a little bit of um, repeat from what Phil had, had talked about, but just so you understand what private landowners deal with in the state of California, we have the Endangered Species Act that forbids the taking of a listed species. As Phil said, without a permit, that taking is hunt, harm, harass, displace, kill, all those kind of things that you've probably heard about. But basically, we can't go in and disrupt a spotted owl from its daily activities without causing take. Um, there's direct and indirect take. Direct take is actually going out, running one over, um, something like that. Indirect take is displacing it through your activities, whether it be cutting down the nest tree or modifying the habitat so much they can no longer perform their daily functions. Um, in my opinion, the Fish and Wildlife Service is very ineffective at enforcing the Native Species Act. There's never been, to, to any of our knowledge, we talked about this before the, the seminar here, there's never been a successful prosecution of take of NSO anywhere, um, but yet in our careers we've all seen where those cases have happened. Um, the service there, and it's not these people, they're not the enforcement branch, but the enforcement branch just doesn't do anything about it. And so in California, there's other mechanisms that, that lead us to where we are that Oregon and Washington don't necessarily have. So that's why I bring this up. And what California has are the Forest Practice Rules from 1973 and the Forest Practice Act that goes with it. I'll read a little bit of, of, this, or of this to you. Uh, the Public Resource Code states that the intent of the Forest Practice Act is to assure that A, where feasible, the productivity of timberlands is restored, enhanced, and maintained. So part of the rule is we want timber produced. That's in the rules. The other part is the goal of maximum sustained production of high quality timber products is achieved while giving consideration to the values relating to recreation, watershed, wildlife, range and forest, forage, excuse me, fisheries, regional economic vitality, employment, and aesthetic enjoyment. And in there you saw wildlife, so that's where the link with spotted owls is. Um, within the forest practice rules, you can't just start your chainsaw up and go cut a tree. There's a lot of process and planning that has to go before you can start your chainsaws up. We have to get what's called a timber harvest plan, or THP. And that is, is something that is required by the state that outlines what you're going to do, where you're going to do it, how you're going to do it, what your impacts are going to be to both the timber, the productivity of the land, and the public trust resources, fish, water, wildlife, air, aesthetics, all those kind of things. And if you haven't ever seen a timber harvest plan, this is one, double-sided. And this does not include the confidential archaeology addendum. So this is several hundred pages um, that every time somebody wants to cut trees, they need to prepare one of those documents and submit it to the state. It goes through interagency review. All the agencies come out and look at the property. It's, it's CAL FIRE, it's Fish and Game, Water Quality, Mines and Geology, Wheeler, Dirk, who am I missing? State Parks sometimes. I mean, they all come out, take a look, and see what we're doing. And then they have to basically sign off on it. Um, within that approval process, the require, uh, excuse me, the Department of Cal Fire must disapprove any THP that its implementation would result in a taking or finding in jeopardy of any species listed by the uh, California Fish and Game Commission. That would be a, a CESA, California Endangered Species Act listed species, National Marine Fisheries Service, or U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. 
within the forest practice rules back in the early 90s as Phil mentioned he was part of this several iterations have happened since then but there's habitat retention requirements that are in the rules that tell us to avoid take this is what you have to do or, or more appropriately this is what you can't do and it revolves and I'll get into the specific numbers in a little bit but it involves how much habitat needs to be left after you're done the rules have been continuously supplemented by guidance by U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service concerning uh, North of Spotted Owls. And something recent, it requires a spotted owl expert to be consulted to evaluate impacts to NSO. And to be an SOE, you have to submit a resume to, um, actually I can't remember if it's CAL FIRE or Fish and Game, but they look it over and assess your qualifications and give you a stamp of approval that you can then assess what the impacts of a timber harvest plan would be. The last thing that, that kind of ties all this together is CEQA or the California Environmental Quality Act. It basically mandates that, that again no project can be approved by the state to be a result in the take of a listed species. Under CEQA a THP is a CEQA equivalent document which basically means this and, and that's why they're so big and cumbersome this is basically the state equivalent to an environmental impact report. Um, and yeah, sorry, that's my last bullet point. So, how do we go about determining the effects in, in what we do? The first step is we go out and these little yellow polygons are where we propose to go cut trees. So we look at this area, look at it on a map, and we say, okay, this this is on private land. This is on private land, yes. Thank you for that clarification. It's going to be completely 180 degrees different on federal lands, for the most part. This is, this is private lands. So we, our, our foresters lay out some areas where they think, okay, um, our growth has slowed down. We have enough standing volume that we can economically harvest these trees. And, and so they pencil these areas out. They give it to me. Then I go to the state database that Phil mentioned that Gordon Gould started in 70 something, a long time ago. Um, and so within the state database is basically every owl that's ever been detected in the state, at least spotted, spotted owl, thank you. Um, and some barred owls now, we're getting, we're getting there, but yeah, you're right, this is, this is the NSO database, so the spotted owl database. Um, every owl that's been observed within the last 40 some years, as long as somebody reported it to the database. So we've got this, then, okay, there's red dots, okay, there's owls around, what does that mean? This database also links each observation back to an activity center. An activity center is where a territorial bird or pair of birds lives. So it could be a nest site, it, as, as Phil mentioned, or maybe it was Jan, I can't remember, they only, I think Jan mentioned, they only nest every other year for the most part, so in years where they're not nesting, it's where the pair is just hanging out during the breeding season. It could be a territorial single as well. But this is, this is the, the territories, and, and all these dots are, are going back, attributing to the observations to an activity center. So in this case, we've got proposed harvest units, down here in section 15, about right here. I've got an activity center up here. In the Klamath province, we have to analyze out to 1.3 acres, or excuse me, miles. I wish it was 1.3 acres. Um, so we have to know what's going on within 1.3 miles of our proposed harvest. In, in different geographic regions in the Northwest, it, it's over two miles up in Oregon and Washington, and on the coast, it's, it's half mile or 0.7 miles. It, 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 it's based on the median home range of spotted owls in that region. So here we're worried about 1.3 miles. So oh, I'm sorry, I got ahead of myself a little bit. Um, we can go into the database and it, it tells me exactly what was seen at this, this, this site. In 2004 there was a nest. Best compare, they raised one young. Um, all the information for the history of that site is in this database and we can, can look at all that. Um, so then I, I measure from our proposed harvest unit back to the activity center. What is that, 1.4 miles? So in this case, we're free and clear for the most part for our planning. Anyway, we, we know we don't have anything at least initially to worry about. So the next step is we come back. Again, we look at our units, proposed unit. We, we need to determine what 
sort of habitat is out there. So we look at aerial photos. Almost every industrial forest landowner around here has an extensive forest inventory database. We, we call it GIS. For Roseburg's property, and I think pretty much everybody else, it's fairly standard. There's one in inventory plot out on the forest for every four acres. And they go out to measure trees, measure growth, measure things like snags and down wood for wildlife, canopy cover, those sort of things, uh, the diameter and age of the forest. And so we have an extensive database of, of what our forests look like, both visually and um, with numbers. And then we look at the photos to make sure that stuff matches. And then we come up with, with what we call our Northern Spotted Owl habitat types. And this is a depiction of, of different habitat types out there. And on this um, slide, we have basically, it's, it's marginal habitat. We've got a little nesting, roosting habitat down here. But the rest of this is foraging, low quality foraging, and non-habitat. So the next step then, is to determine where we need to survey. Surveys are a big part of what I do in, in every timber company. We can't get a timber harvest plan approved without surveys to document that we're almost certain there are no owls out there. U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service released a new protocol in 2011. Um, it, it changed quite a bit from the old one. The old one, we could do one, year's, one year of surveys. We could do three visits a year. Um, out to 0.7 miles. The new one says for two years prior to harvest, we have to visit the entire area six times a year. Again, out to 1.3 miles from the plan area. Call points should be a quarter to a half mile apart. So what does that look like? Those red dots are my call points. So we send a crew out there on every night all summer. They're out there for 10 minutes at each one of these points, they're playing a, a digital recording with spotted owl, both sexes, different types of calls. Spotted owls have a pretty amazing range of vocalizations, um, but we play all those to try to elicit responses from another territory owl if it was out there. You gonna call for I meant to bring it in, but... Yeah. You're out. Okay, I was gonna, thank you. You saved me. You saved me. That's the barred owl. <laughs> this is fine. Yeah, this is fine. So if you couldn't I hear that, away. yeah. I meant to bring my digital caller in, I forgot it's out in the truck, but a male spotted owl, his typical four note will sound something like this. So we, we, we used to do it by voice. Um, what, we learned, what we learned were that spotted owls, we'd get used to hearing people and know that it wasn't somebody they needed to worry about. They stopped calling. So that's why the protocol now requires digital calls of actual spotted owls. Um, spotted owls are pretty, pretty bright. They pick up on things pretty quick. And there's no point in them wasting energy to defend a territory if they don't need to. And so that's why detections were starting to go down with voice calling. And some guys like my own boss just weren't very good at it. <laughs> um, but anyway, um, so this is our call point map. Like I said, we go out there, we survey for owls. Um, if there are no responses after two years, we can assume that there are no territorial owls present, and we can go ahead, submit that data to CAL FIRE, and, and they can approve the THP. If we find resident owls, we need to do, need to do habitat analysis to, to see what we have out there. So these are the habitat requirements. Um, currently for the Klamath and Cascade region, basically no harvesting in a thousand feet in the activity center. Again, activity center is a nest site, a pair roost site, or a, a territorial single roost site, and they have to be there for multiple times, multiple times throughout the year. So within um, a half mile of that activity center. We have to basically keep 50% of it in high quality habitat. A half mile circle is roughly um, 1,000 acres. So within that, we have to keep 500 acres suitable. 250 of that must be high quality nesting, roosting, or nesting <coughs> and nesting, roosting habitat. From a half mile out to 1.3 miles, we have to leave another 935 acres, at least 655 acres of that needs to be foraging habitat, and we can have as little as, or as many as 200 acres of low quality foraging habitat. And then the last thing is no more than one third of the habitat within that 
circle or those circles can be uh, operated on during the life of that THP. If any of this doesn't make sense, raise your hand and let me know. I'm kind of flying <laughs> through this. Does it make sense to you? Yes. <laughs> I didn't think I'd say no. Yes. <laughs> so, habitat retention on a big, larger scale, landscape scale. Owls been listed for almost 25 years. Landowners have been working around these owls for that long. And after this much time, basically, where we have owls, we've, we've cut the habitat down to the point where there's not a lot left. I mean, there's enough left that we meet the rules, but we, we've manipulated it to the point where, where we haven't caused take, and so that's where we are. Um, what does that result in? Well, within that 1.3 miles around every owl, there's not much management that can be done anymore. It, it's been done. We've done what the law allows, and that's about it. So that puts a lot of people in a lot of binds. Um, when we don't have enough habitat, and this is an example of that, this is actually in Jan's backyard, um, up by uh, Yreka, this is an owl site. The little red dot in the middle there is, is a nesting pair of birds that nested for the last five years, but as you can, well, maybe not, maybe you don't know, but um, clear cut, clear cut, brush, juniper, um, CNO this, that's not spotted owl habitat. You've got a little bit of spotted owl habitat here in the core, but nowhere near the uh, almost 1,500 acres of habitat you would need within that circle. So, in this case, there, there's really not much we could do at all. We could do some light thinning in areas of habitat, but we can't degrade the habitat anymore. So, so we're kind of stuck in situations like this, and, and within this region, there's quite a few situations like this out there. Um, so how do we deal with that? Well, like I said, we can't take an owl, so the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has given us scenarios to avoid take. Um, you, you can just say you're not going to harvest in habitat. Um, you can, if you don't have habitat, there's some seasonal restrictions and different scenarios. I won't go through all those, but this is just an example of, of the rules we play by on how to avoid take. Other options are to take birds. Uh, Lowell mentioned the Habitat Conservation Plan. That's Phil. Well, I'm sorry. Phil's yeah, Lowell's the one that started it. Uh, Phil mentioned the Habitat Conservation Plan that he worked on with Lowell at Simpson, now Green Diamond. If I haven't confused you now, I never will. Um, so habitat Conservation Plans are one option the private landowners have to work with owls around owls and, and that sort of thing. Currently in California, there's 815,000 acres of timberland covered under existing HCPs. There's another almost 700,000 acres under very varying states of HCP development. And how this next bullet point talks about that development. How long did it take you, to, you and Lola to get that first HCP? Two years? The first one took about, yeah, two years. Two years. That's... That they took seven, eight, nine, ten. Yeah, some of these that are that I have under development, they're nine, ten years in the making, and they're still not signed. Some of that is because they're no longer just spotted owl plants or multi-species plants. So you throw salmon and, and murrelets and all kinds of other things in there, and, and every time you add a species, it adds to the complexity. But they're very expensive. They take a very long time to obtain. And so the, the landowner has to be committed to that piece of land and managing it long term before they even think about it. There's one or two um, kind of smaller landowners that use a safe harbor. I'm not that familiar with them, but it is another option. The Van Dyke Forest in Humboldt or Mendocino County has a safe harbor agreement. Basically it says that if they grow spotted owl habitat and spotted owls move in, they're not necessarily going to be responsible for those. It's, I said it's a, it's a little nebulous to me, but, but there is another option there that, that if they agree to conserve and provide and recruit spotted owls, they kind of get a get-out-of-jail-free pass. That's my simplification of that. Um, so, what is the, the, well, what is the listing resulted in in terms of changes in forestry in California? It, it's without question increased the cost of the TAP to, to be prepared. All those surveys cost a lot of money. A typical survey for us costs about $15,000 per year. 
Um, I just mentioned the two first years that we go out, we do all those surveys, but then for, it's, it's, you're still not free and clear. You have to do what's called spot checks after that. So before you harvest in any consecutive or concurrent year, you have to go out three times and in a much smaller area, but you have to make sure owls haven't moved into your harvest area. And then after a couple of those years, you gotta start all over again and do the two years of six visits. It's decreased the land base on which owners can manage their timber. It's, again, you've got all these circles out there where owls are living. There's, there's limitations that you have that, that prevent you from managing all that timber within those. So there's some owners with over 100 activity centers on their property, you know, extrapolate to that. For the worst case scenario, 1,500 acres, you know, and each one of those 100 activity centers is off limits. So their land base has shrunk in terms of where they can manage. Um, Phil mentioned, I think, it's largely taking the small landowners out of the timber business. You can imagine a, a rancher that's got a 160 acre parcel of timber, wants to cut some trees to send his kid to college. You know, he's got $30,000 in owl surveys, another twenty dollars to $30,000 in the preparation of this document. His timber is only worth $50,000. He's $10,000 upside down right there. So it, it's it's not just the spotted owl, it's all the regulation involved, but um, it, it's basically made it uneconomical for, for the small folks to manage their timber. In my opinion, it's, it's likely increased the intensity of the, the, the remaining industrial lands. And by that I mean, um, if you've got, let's say, you know, 100 acres of habitat within that 1.3 miles mile circle around an activity center that is above and beyond what the forest practice rules or consultation with the service requires. You, you could lightly thin that and, and get, you know, I was throwing a number out there, 500,000 board feet of timber from that light thin. You could throw in a couple clear cuts and get maybe 2 million board feet of timber. In either case, you're degrading the habitat to such an extent that you won't be able to do anything there in the future. So what I've seen industrial landowners do and managers is, okay, if we're going to degrade this habitat, let's get the most out of it that we can. It's just dollars and cents. It's finances. You know, let's get the most volume out that we can on those acres. And start another rotation. And start another rotation, yes. Yeah, clear cutting is not necessarily inexpensive, but long term it is the most efficient and, and the forest practice rules require what's called stocking after we're done, so we have to replant those air, air areas, those acres. We, we don't have a choice, it's a requirement. Um, Phil mentioned small communities. Since 2000, nearly 30 mills in California have closed. Um, more, more than that since listing, I couldn't find the exact number. Not all of those are within the range of the spotted owl. Again, there's other issues. The, the, change in philosophy on federal lands. A lot of these mills were supported by nothing but federal timber, and so uh, when the philosophy on federal lands changed, those, man, those mills just simply couldn't make it. There were no private lands around. Um, and there used to be a number of publicly traded timber companies in California, Georgia Pacific, Louisiana Pacific. Um, there was a couple others. They left the state. It was too volatile, too unpredictable, and too long-term for them. You know, shareholders want to return every quarter. In California, that's pretty hard to do. You need to look years, decades, and, and centuries down the road. And, and families typically can do that. Um, boards and shareholders, not so much. So what we're left with is, is nearly every large industrial timberland owner in the state is, is privately or, or family-owned. Um, it's also led to some very innovative, good forest practice, forestry practices before the spotted owl and, and I think Simpson's HCP, you didn't see little islands of habitat left in the middle of clear cuts. Those are what we call HRAs or habitat retention areas. What we saw on Green or Simpson Green Diamond was that um, owls lived in second growth. They did quite well but there were elements within that second growth that they were using to nest. It was one old maple left along a creek. It was a, a small patch of a burned out redwood that had a cavity that, that the owls could nest in. So we looked at what owls did. We tried to implement that on, on future management. So that's why we're leaving patches of timber 
And I think every industrial landowner in the state does this. They, they leave stuff for future recruitment. And basically the idea is if you've got a 50 year rotation, which means, you know, a rotation would mean you come in, you cut this, you plant it, 50 years later you come back, you do it all over again. Those patches in the middle, we're going to leave for at least one rotation. So if you've got 50 year old trees there now, by the time that stand is mature, you're going to have 100 year old trees. What happens in the midst of a 50 year old forest? Yes, thank you. Um, and again, that allows a, a, a foothold for these late cereal species to get into these young men stands earlier than they otherwise would be. And we found that to be very effective. Uh, again, I'm drawing a lot of uh, examples from the coast and Green Diamond, one because I worked there, and two because they were the first ones to implement this, and so we, we see how it's working. They have had spotted owls nesting in HRAs surrounded by stands as young as 17 years old. Atkins Meadow. It's it is surrounded by uh, yes. lodgepole pine that don't grow too big. Uh, most of that is is not lodgepole. Some of it is, but a lot of it on the outskirts is not. You transition pretty quick. Um, so, has this worked? This first um, example is is not scientific. It's more anecdotal. But if you look at the the state database and California, California Forestry Association did this last year in relation to the state petition to list the, the Northern Spotted Owl under the California Endangered Species Act. Um, they concluded the Trends and MSO Pair Territory, excuse me, I'll start that over. Trends and MSO Territory, Territory data suggest California has a healthy, well distributed, dynamic yet stable population of pair territories with a substantial increase in known occupied habitat. So, from the database, which Phil and I have mentioned, you can look at pairs over time, 1988, 950, and this is, this is all lands, not just private. So, Dirk, here's your answer, 3,061 pairs in 2003. So, you can see it over time, at least in the database, things are increasing. That doesn't necessarily mean we have more owls. That means that we've surveyed more areas, we're getting better at our surveys, um, and, and so it, it, it may represent more owls, it may represent the same number of owls, we don't really know, but at least in terms of the known sites that we can track, they've increased you know, over the last 20, 30 years. This does not re re represent the demographic data that Jan presented with the annual 3% per year uh, decline across the range. Again, likely to get worse with the barred owls. And speaking of barn owls, California has not seen the, the heavy invasion yet that Oregon and Washington have. I think it's coming. Um, some places it, it is happening on the coast in the Redwoods. They're seeing a lot of barn owls. I believe on the goose nest, they're covered in barn owls. Um, so I think it's happening. We got a few here. Yeah, we've got a few, but it, it, they haven't taken over yet um, like they have in other areas. But I suspect it's. You know, they're coming from the north, so it's just a matter of time. Um, there's a couple sites that, that were mentioned, Green Diamond, who bothered or looking to, to try to stem that tide um, with some remo removal experiments, and, and so far that looks promising. So success stories. Again, the, the Green Diamond HCP approved in 92, allowed the take of 50 pairs of, of spotted owls in the first 10 years of a 30-year plan. They're, um, renegotiating that plant and, and trying to get a multi-species plant now. Uh, it requires extensive monitoring of the populations of spotted owls. Over the, the years since inception, they've banded over 1,700 individual spotted owls. And, and that's part of their agreement with the service that allows them to, to do these takes as they monitor the population and, and get the demographic data that Jan was mentioning, the reproduction, the survival, all those sort of things. We can track movements to see where birds go. It requires extensive habitat retention and recruitment. I showed you the, the, the clear cuts around Athens Meadow. That's Roseburg property. We retain uh, about 10%. That's largely driven by our FSC certification. Uh, we don't have owls. Um, actually, in that picture, there were owls associated, but most of our property, we don't have owls, but we still retain 10%. We'll see in 20, 30 years if owls move into that because of the better habitat. Um, but on Green Diamond, they're at about 
um, off limits between their stream courses for their salmon, their upland retention for things like fishers and spotted owls, about 25% of their ownership is, is in reserve areas. Um, they were the first to use habitat retention areas. It allows them flexibility in harvesting that they wouldn't otherwise have under the forest practice rules. And, and they had so many owls over there that their circles were overlapping. I had one THP that had seven pairs of owls associated with it. So you can imagine how difficult it is to, to do anything um, harvesting-wise with all those birds. And so basically they, they, they would not have been able to continue to operate without this habitat conservation plan. And there's other companies in that same boat that they just had so many birds and were so confined and HCP was the only way to go and still remained economically viable. Um, Roseburg, from our perspective, um, we were very happy negotiating with the, the service in Jan. We got a survey waiver for some of our areas, and, and that was because we, we looked at 20 years of survey data where basically we didn't have any owls, and it was extensively surveyed. Our forest inventory system that I mentioned earlier basically said you don't have spotted owl habitat, and that was based on on habitats that, that Jan's husband, Brian, and others uh, built based on known spotted owl uh, occupancy. That allows us to prove THPs without actually doing surveys, and that's a huge savings for us. Um, and this is, this is how that waiver came about. Um, basically, simplify this real quick, if you've got no nesting roosting habitat, it really doesn't matter how much other habitat you have, you won't have Territorial spotted owls. For some reason, um, even, well, actually, I can tell you the main reason, we have very few trees over 26 inches uh, DBH or diameter breast height. So that takes almost our entire forest and knocks it down to foraging habitat because we don't have that many big trees. In the future, we're going to have those big trees because we're retaining them. But uh, that's the primary driver that, that causes most of our ownership to be in foraging and low quality foraging <laughs> habitat. And the models say that you're, you know, it's probably no big surprise to people out there that without nesting roosting habitat, you're not going to have nesting roosting um, owls. So Phil's prompting me here. Well, I think that model is interesting. I, um, if people are, are interested, I, I think that's a really good representation of how mm. spotted owls occur on the landscape. And maybe Rich can explain it. <laughs> Take a look at the beads here. Um, so basically, it's a three axis graph, I hate those, but here you've got hectares, we'll just pretend it's acres, acres of nesting roosting habitat. So this is the best habitat, this is where owls nest and roost. It's going to be the big trees, the old trees, um, and so this is how much of that is, is out there on the landscape. Here's acres of foraging habitat, so this is where they eat. And then this is the probability of occupancy. It, it's what is the likelihood that, that owls are actually going to live on this landscape. So if you come over here, if you've got a lot of nesting roosting habitat, come over here and you've got a lot of foraging habitat, come back here, you're going to have a high likelihood that spotted owls are going to occupy that landscape. If you've got no habitat, you've got zero probability that you're going to have owls occupying that landscape. So on Roseburg's ownership, we have a lot of foraging habitat, very little nesting roosting habitat, and so our um, probability of occupancy in this area for the waiver was very low. I'd like to just add to that a couple caveats. A couple caveats with this. This is a representation of the interior in northern California, southern Oregon. This doesn't apply everywhere. And the other thing was the thing that allowed us to get there with this waiver, which was substantial, that represented a, a pretty large area of Roseburg um, ownership. It was based on this, along with the 20 years of survey data that they had. So, so we you know, used the best available science in conjunction with the survey data that supported what they were saying. Look, we've surveyed all this area for 20 years, we're not finding any owls. There's a very, very low density of owls on, on most of, of Roseburg ownership. So um, that, that was taken 
And there's a time limit too. So yes. So we'll review it yep. after. It expires February 1st of 2016. Yeah, okay. So okay. you owe me a call on that. Yeah. Actually. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, I mean, this, this does not apply across the range of the owls. This is specific to this region. Um, and use site-specific data that Roseburg had to, to help get us where we wanted to be. And it, it was very significant um, in terms of our management and, and keeping costs down. Um, other success stories, uh, locally here, uh, Fruit Grow Supply Company uh, has gotten their HCP approved. I guess it's being litigated, but um, it, it was signed. Sierra Pacific Industries is, is pursuing an HCP for their property. Um, their data for, for Trinity County shows that uh, um, since 89, they've had a very stable population based on activity centers. Again, no demographic data, but interpreted it just, just based on occupancy, they're doing pretty good. Um, and with that, I'll wrap it up. Any questions? And actually, I, I welcome questions for any of our three speakers. So if, if Phil and Jim want to answer your questions as well, we have about 15 minutes left. So I know you would hand up your hand. Hey, uh, could you comment on the effect of uh, you know man-made things in the whole scheme of things like uh, highways, railroads, cities? Um, to my knowledge, there's no link with any of those infrastructure um, characteristics to spotted owls. Um, I suspect you're talking about the Sac Canyon with the I-5 and, and the railroad going up it, and that's where a lot of our waiver area is that it just doesn't have owls. Um, I don't know. It's hard to say. Um, I know other areas where you've got Highway 101 and Highway 299 running right through a similar landscape and it's full of owls. So, I, you know, I don't know what that is, if anything. So, oh, yeah, go ahead. You can call it. Uh, I'm at the stage in my career where I can engage in ranked speculation. <laughs> so, um, Rich, would you say that, and, and Jan, that often you don't find spotted owls deep in canyons where there's high stream noise? But I, I, that's, that would, in the old days, that was my experience sometimes on the McLeod, and it makes sense because owls respond to each other by calls. I've often wondered about the low density in the Sacramento Canyon because of the background noise of Interstate 5 and the train. Now, it would, it would take some, some real heavy duty science to really sort that out. I'm saying it's speculation. I'm, I'm saying it's a reasonable hypothesis. Marty, is that what? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe this is just getting at the same thing, but owls, um, there are abiotic features that are associated with owl occupancy. And I'm thinking of areas low on slope positions of major water streams, like the Sacramento River, like the Salmon River, like the Trinity River, down low next to the river, they're not found there. They're, fa they're associated with tributaries, but on lower slope positions of those tributaries, like that graphic that I had that showed that stream and the cluster of locations. So I don't know, Arnie, if that's kind of getting at what you were asking. Um, you know, they're not associated with major ridge tops. They're, they may use them, but their use level of those areas are low. So they're usually found in tributary, lower order streams, up in the tributaries and low slope positions. Does anybody, any of you, have anything to say about the Mexican spotted owl and how it relates to the scheme of things here in the far west? Um, I don't know a whole lot about the Mexican spotted owl, but they're very limited in distribution and habitat. They're very associated, very much associated with um, canyons and deep canyons, um, not terraced habitats, but deep canyons in New Mexico um, and. Arizona, some parts of Arizona and Utah, southern Utah. Um, I don't know about their like demographic performances right now, like how they're doing, as well as like are they declining? I don't know. I don't know if they if they have threats um, by barn owls like we do. I know there's some overlap, um, but 
don't know. I, I'm spending so much time on the species. I wish I knew a little bit more. <laughs> if, if I remember correctly from a talk Bowl gave a, a little while ago, maybe it was just conversation, there's places where Mexican spotted owls and barred owls have always coexisted. And so there's there's some morph morpho morphology there in terms of size that helps differentiate them in the res resource partitioning. Um, I think it's is it the smallest subspecies of spotted owl, the largest species of barn that occur there. So again, they can partition resources better and they've dealt with each other for a long time. Um, just real quick on the barn owl, um, the most recent genetics suggest that the barred owl and the northern spotted owl before this recent expansion had been separated by in time by is it 2.4 million years so they're not used to dealing with each other here oh yeah. if you can't see this this is a group of our foresters out took them out to show them a spotted owl one of the guys kids it's uh one of the ways or the way we find spotted owl nests is we present them with a mouse. Um, you probably can't see it, but there's a mouse on this little stick um, that Jake's holding. Um, the spotted owl's coming in, taking the, the mouse. It will fly back, and this happened to be the male. He'll fly up, he'll go into a tree, call to the female. The female will come get the mouse, or he'll go deliver the mouse to the female, and the female takes the mouse to the nest, and that's how we find the nest and figure out a, if they're nesting, and B, how many young they have, and those sort of things. Are selective harvest permitted near activity sites? Are, are selective harvest compatible with um, the no-take rule? Yes. Um, within 1,000 feet, no. There's basically nothing you can do within 1,000 feet. But after that, yes, you can, you can do selectively harvest. You're under the same rules, basically. So... You can, even in the selective harvest, you can degrade high quality nesting roosting habitat to you know, low quality foraging. And so in that situation, you'd be bound by the same, and I can find it, you know, the same numbers um, that we would if we were doing even age management. Um, so you know, let's say when you started, you had, let's say all of it was high quality nesting roosting habitat. If you thinned it all and took it down to, to foraging habitat, you would be in violation of the rules. So you still can only have work within the context of what this allows. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. And I guess my other question is, um, is does the conservation of the habitat ever interfere with like thinning for fire safety? That, does fire risk ever raise because uh, harvests were, were reduced? On, on federal lands, yes. Yeah. It, is, it is a difficult thing to navigate through, and we try and reach the balance. Um, on federal lands, that's often the discussion, is achieving that balance of meeting the objective of fire resilience while minimizing the impacts to the elves. It's, it's what I live for right now. <laughs> And, and one thing that's really hard within the context of the Endangered Species Act is, is dealing with short-term degradation and long-term benefit. The Endangered Species Act, you know, for, for private, um, basically doesn't allow us to manipulate a stand short-term, degrade its habitat for long-term benefit um, yeah. without a permit. Um, so, you know, the feds are faced with that a little bit as well. Um, you know, it's, yes, it's a short-term, impact, negative impact, for a long-term benefit, and, and how do you make those things work in the context of the Endangered Species Act and not being allowed to take without a permit? Yeah. And on federal, lands, on federal lands, when we engage in ESA consultation with the federal landowners, often the actions will result in adverse effects and we issue them a take permit. The process that we go through is minimizing that taking minimizing where those adverse effects are occurring. So we participate at great lengths to help design the projects and provide input to where to minimize those effects, to have them occur on the low value habitats, on the ridge tops like, like um, Phil was mentioning, or on south facing slopes where it's hotter and historically the stand conditions were much more open. 
So owls tended to not utilize those areas as much, and they really are focused in that, that deep, dark, lower two-thirds of the slope, where the bigger trees are, where the fires don't burn at great intensities. So that was a really good question from that. Yeah. Oh, that's uh, this little discussion right here provides a really good example of the reasons to uh, get your management of species done before they come to the point of being on the endangered species list. The subspecies that has not been discussed here tonight is the California spotted owl, which occurs in the Sierras from eastern Jasta County down to Southern California. There was a petition to list that species back about 2000, and I was on the group that evaluated that. We determined that the, that the uh, risk of catastrophic fire was greater than the risk of timber harvest to modify fuels. So because the thing was not yet listed, we could, we, in fact, we we chose not to list the California spotted owl. We did not think that it qualified at this point in, in its population status for listing under the Endangered Species Act. And we encouraged strong management of timber stands on federal lands to reduce fire hazard because we thought that fire hazard was a bigger problem for the species than the management of the fuels. That would be a difficult thing to do under the state, the, the, the state of being listed. Get the management done before you come to a population status that demands listing under the law. It, it's, it's one of the inflexibilities under the Endangered Species Act as, as we know it now. It's one of the flexibilities that could possibly be built into the Endangered Species Act if we had a Congress that was sane. <laughs> By Rand. <laughs> yeah, um, I'm wrestling a little bit with, uh, and, and maybe you, you can, uh, you can uh, help me out. But when you're talking about uh, clarifying from an economic standpoint, you go in and hit it, grab it, go, you know, and then I guess reforest it or whatever you do. Um, I'm, I'm very involved with, uh, with water things. And it just seems, and also kind of a system person, <laughs> and it just seems to me that if you're clear clay um, and leaving a little you know, uh, you know, condo for the spot owls, you're kind of, there's, a, there's watershed issues, there's you know, visibil visual issues, uh, all these things for the other species and parts of our environment, and um, also from a fire standpoint, it just seems to me that doing more of the managed approach to things overall, it creates a more livable kind of environment for the two-legged folks like us and, and the two-winged people and things like that. And I've spent time in the China side of the high altitude in Tibet, and uh, they, they haven't had any forest management there, and there's you know, not, a lot, not a lot of anything vegetation-wise, and, and I, you know, I guess the, the clear-cutting thing is something maybe, maybe you can uh, put my mind at rest so I can have a thanks sleep. To do it justice, it's a whole other seminar, but, <laughs> but just real quick, um, aesthetics are a big issue with clear-cutting. People just flat don't like the way they look. As a biologist, I see great benefit in them. They're species that we only find in clear-cuts, as opposed to a, a more mature, more homogeneous larger forest. Um, if, I, I didn't put the slide in there, but if you take spotted owls on the coast, they do, and Phil, you can refute me or tell me a full of it if, if you want, but I, I think we're on the same page here, um, that spotted owls on the coast do much better in a managed forest where they are clear cutting. And it has to do with one thing, their prey. Jim and Phil both mentioned wood rats. Wood rats love young brushy forests, young reforested stands. And you'll get, I can't remember the exact numbers, um, the way I remembered it, in the clear cuts over there, we had higher biomass, so more weight of wood rats per acre than we did deer. 
And that's what the spotted owls fed on. And so when you have a, a mix of, you know, you call it the bed and the breakfast, you've got your old stands where they live and they nest, and you've got the young stands where they go to feed. And, and so I said, that's just one example. Over here in this area, um, again, if I'm getting in the weeds too much, pull me off, but um, watershed issues. 90% of the erosion comes from road and skid trails, not the actual harvest unit itself. Um, and so when you're doing uneven age management, at least what Roseburg used to do, they were entering stands every seven to 10 years, opening every road and every skid trail in that basin. That's where your erosion was coming from. When you do even age management, you get in there once, at least for the skid trails within that stand, you use them once and then you put them to bed and you let them rest for 50 years. So there's, there's things like that that, that, you know, I'm not saying even age management is perfect, but I can show you areas where even age management, at least from a biological perspective for late cereal species, was way worse than even age management with retention. And that's because that there's multiple entries on short intervals Every time a tree started to die, they'd go cut it. Um, you know, that's just what they did. That's how uneven age management was practiced. And so you never got snags, you never got big trees, and you never had those late successional elements that species like spotted owls and fishers, um, goshawks need. But you gotta have stream buffers. You gotta have stream buffers, yeah, absolutely. You know, there's, there's you know, streams are a whole other thing, and, and stream buffers, are the same whether you're doing even age management, clear cutting, or uneven age management, you know, selectively harvesting. They're the same. That's driven by the forest practice rules. Um, you know, so if, if you want to have a, a you know, further discussion on that, you want to take a field trip, go look at some of this stuff, I can provide you, you know, data from studies that talk about erosion and where it's coming from, disturbed, undisturbed versus wildfire, all those kind of things. It's, I mean, it's, like I said, it's a whole other hour or two discussion. And but it's a good question. And unfortunately, we're going to have to cut it off here because we are at 8 o'clock. Um, I want to thank our speakers once again for three excellent Um, I did want to mention we're going to be taking a break in July. We are working on our uh, fall lineup, though. We're going to be talking about drought, climate change, um, and uh, water yields coming out of course. So stay tuned. If you're interested in hearing about our future workshops for the fall, sign up for our mailing list. I promise not to spam you too much. <laughs> um, but once again, thank you for coming. And I'm Kara Bailiff with the Shepherd Valley Resource Conservation District. And have a good night.